Thank you. Appreciate it. It's great to be here at the Roosevelt. Uh, Mike's right. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I went to, I saw those UCLA, one of the judges, an SC guy. I actually went to business school at USC and uh, grew up in San Fernando Valley and uh, ended up uh, for undergraduate at uh, Santa Barbara, only because I grew up surfing. Oh, there's a, and I'm, oh, most of my companies, I try to stay down at the beach uh, for the same flow. And uh, I decided today you know, to talk about really just about my drive, what's, I think I was reflecting on this a couple weeks ago when Bambi kindly asked me to speak. And uh, I kind of had like six core things that kept coming the same theme. And I haven't done this presentation yet, so it's fresh. So if I sound like a little weird, that's because it's fresh and you guys are the first ones in it. But I think it's pretty good. And uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, it was good to get here actually. Part of, part of uh, my theme on six ways to be, and be is the key word. You'll see be in everything. I don't know, it's a cute marketing gimmick I always use, but my last name's Berman and now I have Beachman and my partners were Bejarano and currently uh, Berdakin, so I don't know how that happens. But part of the, part of the interesting uh, themes I'll talk about, and there's six of them, keep reflecting in my life, and it all comes down to uh, prioritization and uh, opportunity and networking. And the, you can't hear me? I even got a clicker. Someone used a cool beam. I don't know how to do that. That's fancy. This is nice. Uh, and uh, you know, it's great even to be here. Actually, I had my, and thanks for, someone was flexible. I had my kids. The most astonishing thing, actually, before I started my career is I have triplets. So it's possible to have a very, very busy, everyday personal life and to do a lot of startups. And the year I started MySpace is the year my kids were born. So it's kind of crazy. And I just left my kids Little League World Series to drive in my wonderful hometown traffic to get here, and I'm glad I'm here. So uh, there's a lot, a lot I'm doing. But the first one rule that I have here is to be opportune. And uh, you know, I think when I talk to a lot of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs and I reflect back on what I used to do, I w I've had jobs picking up trash, working at Domino's Pizza, uh, Miss Fields Cookies, uh, market research calls. Uh, teaching assistant, somehow I was an auditor for two years. I, so I saw KPMG up here. It was not fun, but hey, thank you for sponsoring. Uh, but it was, uh, in each of those fun jobs I had, I always took the opportunity to just surround myself with smart people, listen and learn from smart managers, try to get myself into situations where even if I was a fly on the wall, and from flipping pizzas to getting on market research calls, which I find so annoying, but I did that for about a year and a half. Uh, I learned a ton uh, growing up, and I was able to leverage that uh, experience to kind of make uh, a lot of my luck and my, a lot of my opportun opportunities that I've been fortunate to have. So, you know, one of the takeaways I always tell people is always be, even if it doesn't seem like the great situation and you're at a job you don't necessarily love and you're not passionate about, is just to think about the opportunities that you can create and uh, make sure you're there when they exist. And the last thing I noted on there is sometimes a dual path is necessary. So if you're in that position that you don't love and you do have a spark to do something in the future, uh, that's okay. Continue what you're doing, but always thrive towards what you're passionate about uh, as well. And I th even I could figure this out. There's a big next button. Okay, what's my next slide? I have some pretty slick marketing people, so this is way better than I've ever had. Uh, this one is to be brave, and uh, this whole thing's about once you find the thing you love, you have to kind of go for it, and you're never gonna make it unless you're brave and jump in. And uh, I've done this a few times. My first company, actually I jumped in. I had an apartment in Hermosa Beach. I lived with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my lovely wife, and uh, I told her, honey, one day we're gonna have six programmers in our apartment just to like, we're gonna have to hang out in the back room. Wasn't very happy with it, but I kind of went for it on my first startup uh, out of business school. And I also, even worse than that, is I drained my credit cards to start the company. But I, was, I felt at the time, although we, I, lost, I lost the company, I lost like 60 grand, at the time I just went for it and racked up debt. And you know, I was a kid out of business school with a lot other more debt, so I said, why not? Let's go for it. And, uh, and that's kind of how I started. But I liked the concept and I jumped in and it really led me to network and be, meet a, another passionate entrepreneur uh, when I started my first company in 98 called X Drive Technologies. And that was, you know, we're all living and everyone's talking about bubbles and such, but I don't know if everyone remembers the NASDAQ in 2000, but it was pretty high, way higher than it is today. And uh, it was an interesting time because I was able to raise 
I think I was 28, I can't remember. I don't want to date myself. But it was everybody's $110 million with my partner. And we ended up spending it all. So it was kind of fun, uh, fun period of time. The company uh, ended up in bankruptcy only to be bought back uh, for like a million dollars. And then we sold it for 25 million. So eventually it was a good outcome. But uh, I did see a lot of opportunities. But the, the point was we definitely jumped in jumped in with a lot of investors that believed in us. And the company now is a company called Dropbox, which I'm sure many of you guys use. Dropbox, it's the same concept. And those guys I'm big fans of and are doing quite well. So you know, the, the takeaway there is uh, you, know, you got to go for it. Bravery is going to only end up in success. Could end up in bankruptcy, which is OK. But the only way to do it is to jump in and be brave. What do I got next here? Love sports will be most of the slides. I definitely love sports. Uh, is to you know to be a winner, and by that I mean, I mean so many people get so tied up on their equity and how much they own of their company, and unless you've had a success, it's it's really it's kind of a shame because people are so afraid to give away their equity. I'm completely the opposite. I think you have to give away your equity to get a winner. Winning one startup or one event, or even if you join a team that wins you are in a much better shape for the rest of your career and what you want to do next. So I tell people, actually our first company that made it, me and my partner from business school, we were like looking to raise money. We're like, are we going to give up 20%, 30%? We're like, for a million bucks, whatever. We couldn't really get it done because we didn't have a success. So we're like, forget it. Let's just give up half our company for 200 grand. Or it was 300 grand, sorry. We got an extra 100 out of the deal. But it was 300 grand and we gave up 50% of our company and it was the best move I ever did. It, it led us to become successful. We took that 300 grand, made the company profitable, and eventually sold it for uh, multi multiple million dollars. So it was a great thing I did. And I tell people, you know, a half of something or working for a company that you have a 1% of is better than owning 100% of nothing. And uh, the key to it is to get off the ground with a, with a win. And then you have a track record, and you could go from there. Uh, Number four, and I promise there's only six of these because I know I'm, I'm kind of go, going a little fast. And somebody said I have to, I should take some good questions. So uh, I wish I could, so I did grow up surfing. I don't think I ever surfed a wave quite this nice or big. Uh, I probably wouldn't be as brave with my earlier slides. But it, the, the point is, uh, you know, be aware. And I can't say, uh, there's so much about this. Uh, every business I've ever started, uh, before I started it, I always look at the macro trends. And uh, everyone talks about first mover advantage. I completely, I'm the opposite. I like second mover advantage or third mover advantage. Understanding what's going on in the macro marketplace is so important. And what's going on today is pretty amazing. And we've all studied markets. Uh, so if someone do the, the runner slide and watch what Lyft's done and, and Uber's done, I think that's super smart to kind of follow a proven model. And certainly at MySpace, there was a company before us uh, called Friendster. I don't know if anybody now I'm really dating myself. But uh, they were, I remember sitting there at the computer, and me and my partners were like, this is the first time in five years I've gotten hit up by like 11 to 20 different people to join the service. I'm like, what is this? This is crazy. And there's people putting their profile online and, and actually doing a thing. It wasn't even called blogging yet. There's a company called Zanga and LiveJournal. And then there's a company just started called Craigslist. And we're like, this is going to be a monster. We had no idea what we were going to do, but we knew that's where we wanted to be. And uh, I think we went through our list of URL names, and we collected like 100 of them. And one of them was an internet storage company we had called MySpace. And we're like, oh, let's just call it that for now. And nobody liked the name at the time. But it was sh actually, I was watching all the presentations. They're all short and sweet, and I like that. And MySpace was five letters, or no, it's six. No, actually, I'm not that smart. It's seven. And uh, <laughs> Uh, I was thinking space, but we had to have the word Maya in there. And uh, we launched it. It was quick and easy to remember, and that's really why we used the name. And, uh, and we just stuck with it once we had a lot of traffic. But the point was, we were watching what Friendster was doing. We were watching what Zanga and LiveJournal were doing. And we put it all together. And uh, we were just aware of the market opportunities. And even today, on my current business, which is absolutely fantastic, and I'm super passionate about it, uh, myself and my partner were looking back in the macro environment two and a half years ago. And we saw what was happening in the world of shopping and commerce. And I think at the time, many of us probably in this room shop online. But still in the US, it's only about 6% of people shop online. So 94% of all commerce is done at Walmart, Target, Sephora, et cetera. So we're like, man, this is going to explode. And if we could just figure out you know, something and we don't screw it up so bad, we could create a really interesting online commerce company. And that's what we've done at Beachmint for the last couple of years. And uh, it's just we have a lot going for us because the macro tides are the macro wave, I should say, is uh, definitely the swell's going in our direction. So uh, we should be in good shape there. Uh, 
This is uh, going back kind of the equity uh, comment I made earlier is your team and your teammates and coming from my kids baseball game is what makes the unit and you cannot I don't think I, I know I wouldn't be as successful if I didn't give up a good chunk of all of all of our partners gave trusted each other split everything even Steven and went into business all together many times and uh, it's happened at all my ventures from X drive to response space to uh, MySpace to Beachman today you have to surround yourself with a great team and it's not it's got to be people you enjoy working with because you're there you know 14 18 hours a day so it's uh, another key component of this is to have different backgrounds I know one of the things I loved being at MySpace was we had an amazing product person that was just the most creative person I've ever been around and we found him I think we posted an ad on a telephone pole and this kid came in the office and he wrote this uh, he wrote what was really screwed up about our site and we said dude you're the smartest guy we've ever met and uh, it turned out to be you know a 21 year old or 22 year old kid that we found from a telephone pole and we made him our partner and the, it was just and the guy's MySpace Tom and it's one of the best things we ever did and uh, <laughs> thank God we did that uh, so it's just really about t seizing the opportunity getting your teammates all around you and then additionally I found a great technologist I found a great salesperson and I was able to be able to kind of do a few business deals myself so we were able to kind of kick it off and uh, again uh, it's you take the dilution if you're an entrepreneur if you have two of you just to surround yourself with that winning team and it gets you to that first win or second and uh, I'm going to continue to use that playbook as I as I'm doing this venture and perhaps other ventures or ventures I back that's the first thing I look at is is the team that I'm backing or that I'm getting involved with uh, and the last thing is, you know, you really, it's all about passion. People say, oh, sometimes you're lucky. And I just believe you make your own luck and you got to believe in what you're doing and hard work. You make, you make your own breaks and, uh, just being there working day in, day out, even being at events like this, I applaud. I went to an amazing school, USC, which I didn't realize how great it was until probably a few years ago the power of networking at that school even today when I go back and I'm not saying that because I saw somebody from SC maybe a little bit but it reminded me of uh, how amazing that school is and I'm sure a lot of us in this room everyone's here because they do network and uh, it's been awesome for me and I just once you're passionate about what you're doing and you believe in it you kind of share that experience and it's kind of contagious and you have a lot of energy so uh, once you believe in your projects, your partners, uh, and it could be your investment partners down to the, the, the partners you're working with day in, day out, uh, you become kind of immersed in what you're doing and uh, it, it, it really allows you to execute, make your own luck, like I said earlier, and, uh, and focus. And that's, I think it was, although this is a snowboarder, I love, I love, somebody, I heard this and I never forgot it because I think the Kings are, are advanced, the LA Kings, like Wayne Gretzky said, you know, you miss, or you're, you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't take and uh, I think that's great because you really will you got to take shots and I think one of the things I get uh, when I talk to mentors is I take a lot of shots I make a lot of decisions very quickly and I know I'm gonna make in a given day if I make 10 decisions when most people probably make two or maybe I make 15 I know I'm gonna make five really bonehead decisions or three but if I can make two or three really great calls it's going to way make up for the ones that I blow and at least I'm making decisions and progress and then the next day I could probably make even better decisions uh, people do move I find people that move faster that are working hard could actually get stuff done and you could find out results good or bad but you got to take the shots and uh, that's why I, I, I love that quote and uh, it is hockey season so I love hockey uh, so that's that's quickly as somebody was winking at me I think maybe they like me or maybe they said I'm out of time but I think I'm done uh, with uh, I wanted to make it quick and those were the six key points again you know be opportune be brave be get a winner uh, be, be aware of the macro environments uh, be part of a great team and and believe and uh, that's uh, when I was thinking about doing this that's what that's what I thought about those are the first six things that came to mind and I think it's a great playbook that I live by uh, it's luckily worked for me and I'm going to continue to go back to the, that playbook as I move forward so that was that was a quick rundown. Hope I didn't spend too much time. But somebody said I got to answer questions. So uh, you know, fire away. I'll open it up to any questions. Bambi, don't Bambi's got really bad questions. No, she's got. She said she's gonna knock me knock me over with some doozies. Did you promise me a couple? Okay, let's see. Wait, is this on? Hi, Josh Faith Marino from Vader News. Um, I actually have kind of a two-parter. So. Um, 
My first question is about uh, Beachmint and um, uh, considering, you know, the, the kind of traction that subscription commerce has gotten in the last couple of years, um, you know, how, what, what's coming in the, in the next year for Beachmint? How is um, Beachmint going to differentiate itself from its competitors? And then um, for, for my follow-up, um, I, really, I really like your outfit. That's a really awesome jacket and shirt combo. So I tip my hat to you. Is that a, is that a style mint ensemble? Well, your second question answered your first question. That's how we're going to win great merchandise. And, uh, and no, we didn't plan that ahead of time. But it's truly, it comes down to, uh, I was saying, in the macro environment of e-commerce, there's a lot of players in subscription commerce. One thing I've realized by taking shots over the last two years is, not even joking, half, merchandise is key. It's so important to have a great merch, merchandising team. And when we first started, it was myself, who's kind of a marketing business guy and a bunch of tech guys and product guys. We didn't surround ourselves with amazing merchandisers. And when we first started, luckily we realized that and we ended up working, we had a chance to work with, you know, Paris Hilton, who's actually pretty cool, and Kim Kardashian. But we ended up going with like Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen because we knew those, those particular amazing entrepreneurs are great in the fashion world and they're great merchandisers. Uh, we didn't have it in-house, but we realized that's the key to victory. And there's a great friend of mine and my partners that started Nasty Gal, and she's an amazing merchandiser. Her name's Sophia. She's doing amazing in L.A. too, which I think is, is great. And uh, I think that's ultimately what's going to separate the competition is having great merchandisers in your company and, and merchandise to sell to people. Because users are smart. They want to get great value, affordable luxury. Uh, we purposely uh, marketed towards a, towards a girl that's... Uh, wants a great shoe, a great quality shoe, for example, and women's fashion is a focus of our company, so is jewelry. Uh, so that's super important to us, is the product and the partners we work with to provide, the, to provide that product. So I think, thanks for my, uh, I don't know where I got this shirt, but thank you for that. And it is installment. Uh, a lot of men, and there's a lot of women in here too, but we do not market towards men yet, I don't think, and there's a reason, because women are not only better shoppers, it's also, entertainment in some way and online shopping with the, for the women market is much more uh, lucrative in today's world. So we've only, t so this is nothing, none of this is my stuff. We only uh, focus on women right now. Any more questions? Come on. Was okay, so Josh, you talked about being brave. So everybody here has probably had a lot of fear about moving forward or making those decisions. And you talked about how you, know, you just have to make a couple of right decisions. You can make a bunch of wrong decisions but make a couple of right decisions. But um, make that a little bit more real for us and explain you know, a time where you didn't have enough information. You just you know, needed to make a decision. You were afraid, but you were brave. Oh, great question. Um, God, it's happened. So I've made so many mistakes. Where do I start? Uh, you know, I think I think it specifically when we we had to make a lot of even at, at a great one is actually at MySpace. Interesting story. Uh, the five of us that thought of the idea, we actually came from another company and sold it to a public company. So we're on this fun thing called an earnout, which is very interesting and very hard to make work. And uh, we were trying to decide: Do we? We had this great idea, but we're stuck inside this company, and the IP when we first started MySpace was owned by this company. So we had to make a decision, do we go across the street and start it, because we knew this thing had a chance of taking off, or do we just stay with inside that company and kind of keep it flowing and not disrupt what was going on? And we ended up doing the latter, and uh, you know, it was definitely a hard decision, and ultimately the outcome of the growth of MySpace, and we ended up selling it to uh, News Corp, was, uh, a great outcome. It was a very hard decision, but we decided, hey, let's just not mess with something that's going good. We had a lot of traction, and a lot of times you could get derailed. So that was a decision where we had to just go for it, and uh, it turned out to be a, a good outcome. I don't know if it would have been a better outcome the other way. I still don't know to this day, but uh, I, I don't look back on it, and uh, I was excited about it. You know, a couple other things is once you you have an entrepreneur drive and vision, it's always tough to know when to sell it or when to take on new investors. Uh, we tried to sell our company early, which turned out to be at MySpace when we had it going. There's a company called JDate. Uh, I don't know what it's called now. It's a dating service that uh, matched Netter, and they wanted to buy our company for probably a 20th of what we ended up selling it for, a 50th of it. And we tried to do the deal, and it ended up we wanted to do the deal, and when they were supposed to wire the money, they didn't have any money. So we kind of lucked out, and MySpace didn't even take off yet. 
this like the concept and we're able to you know we, we would have made the wrong decision so it's again you know again trying to get trying to do those decisions and uh, and make the right ones and there's there's plenty more that uh, that I've done the wrong way but again it's just about a matter of you know going for it making the making the choice and uh, and executing on it Great. this is gonna become a fireside chat does anyone have any questions and great right behind you Ezra's sister um, and Bambi's sister-in-law. So you mentioned that you had school debt and then you had $60,000 of credit card debt. What was your very next step when that company failed? Obviously, there were next steps that took you away from that, but what was the very next step? Next step was I am definitely headed towards bankruptcy. It's fine. Let's just keep going. But uh, I was, it's interesting. I, I always say there's a dual path and I studied and somehow I ended up in audit. I always, in my head, in case things don't work out, I had a backup plan and having an accounting background, I knew I could go back to, well, there's six or eight firms at the time, now there's I think four, but I knew I could always go, I had a safety net to go back to a regular job as I always thought about it. And, you know, eventually I'd pay off this debt. Student loans, you know, I always had and I felt like I'd always have to make payments on that and they're pretty favorable. Uh, so I didn't really worry about the student debt, but I was just so confident in uh, I was young, I was confident in, in my ideas. I didn't know exactly what would work, but I knew I was gonna become an entrepreneur. And I think it's something where my grandfather was, my father was, and even going throughout school, I knew I'd wanna do my own business one day, and I knew I had to go down this path. I just had no idea what it was. So, hey, I racked up student loans. When I left, it was another, again, hard decision. I, was, I had a great job at 20th Century Fox. I saw someone else at Fox earlier on the panel. It's making pretty good money, good career, and I'm like, this is not for me, and I decided to actually give up, I don't remember what I was making, and go full-time to MBA school and rack up you know, the, the student loan debt. And then when I started the business, I'm like, this sounds interesting. It was a, it was a company to help, again, looking at macro trends, uh, it was a company helping all other companies get online and accept credit cards, and merchant accounts and payment gateways were starting to get going. And I'm like, this is gonna be explosive. It was explosive. We just weren't that successful, so I was pretty. Ex I was pretty happy that I actually did spend the money because it was almost like a second MBA. So the 60 grand I felt was like almost probably a little less than what I spent at USC, but it was still a valuable education uh, to do the startup, and it's allowed me to quickly enter other startups and gain that knowledge and experience in doing it. So I didn't feel too bad, and I don't know maybe it's just my personality. I'm just what's the worst case? I could go get a job and pay it off and still live. Maybe catch, I'd be surfing a little bit more instead of working so much. So, um, so okay, I guess I have another question. Um, so Paul talked about fundraising, and I know a lot of people here have uh, questions about fundraising. You both have raised almost $100 million, more than $70 million, $75 million. And Paul, when he started fundraising, he actually didn't really raise any money initially. So do you have, and, and I, know, I know tons of, um, CEOs, and one CEO told me when he started fundraising, he spoke to 40 CEOs before he went out to speak to VCs, which I thought was a really great piece of advice. Yeah. And so, so you have Paul here who took no money, somebody else who went around and talked to some VCs before they went out to, uh, I'm sorry, CEOs before they went out to VCs to raise money to practice their pitch. Do you have any lessons about fundraising? Definitely, and I think it depends where you are uh, in, your, in your career and life stage. It's very different. I give different advice for people that have been part of a winning team or done a little project that's been successful. But first time fundraising, uh, I don't have that kind of patience to meet 100 CEOs. I don't know how they do it. That's, that's a lot of perseverance and a lot of meetings. Uh, you know, it's really about networking and finding people that are super passionate about what you're specifically doing or they believe in you as a person. Uh, the first company, I didn't have anybody that believed, unfortunately, maybe my parents, but they didn't have any money, that believed in me, so that's why I put my credit card down, racked up the debt, and that uh, didn't work out. Uh, the other company I was talking about where we actually were able to raise $300,000, and it turned out to be a friends and family type situation, and we gave up half our company, uh, which at the time, like our advisors are like, why, this is a great idea, and you guys are almost profitable, why would you, I think we're almost profitable, they're like, why would you give up 50% of your company? And it's one of those things where you just, we didn't have a win and we had to do it. So my advice is, and it came through friends and family, and everybody hears this, that's probably people that believe in you or people that mentor you, 
and that, once you're that passionate about the project, I think that's the best source. Uh, I've been a believer after you've done something, I do like the venture capital community. I think they want to make bets in really smart people. They have to make bets, and uh, if you have a good idea and you're willing to invest, you're making a bet on yourself. Most of us that are doing our projects, we're spending a lot of time. Many of us aren't getting salaries. Uh, so we're doing the hard work and we're, we're investing in the same venture. So I feel pretty good about it. If I know I'm investing and I'm true to it, that I think it's pretty good to go out and have an investor that's like, this person, this girl, this guy is really working hard at it, and I'm going to invest alongside it because if they do make it, um, I should get a nice return. And uh, I think that's the way, way to go about it. That's a great question, and I'm pretty passionate about it, so thank you. And I did, that dog walker company I thought was really, that was a cool logo, actually. I really like that one, so I'm now more excited than ever because I need another good dog walker. Uh, on a side note, I am pretty excited about what's happening. Being a huge LA, native LA person, big fan of LA. Uh, in fact, I'm super excited that Eric Garcetti just won the election. Sorry if somebody didn't like Garcetti, but I think he's super technology focused and I think he's actually going to be pretty fantastic. And I have been fortunate to be a part of a lot of incubators that have come recently in Los Angeles. Uh, I work in downtown Santa Monica and there's a great community, great energy. And I think it's silly to compare us to Silicon Valley because I don't think we need to. It's not, we're not Silicon Valley. But what we are and what's happened over the last, I'd say 10 years since I started XDrive in 98, wow, 15 years, man. Uh, last 15 years, there's been so much strides in Los Angeles, just events like this, networking, incubators that are down here, venture capitalists that are funding it. There's been a lot of successful companies that are really focused on profitability. There's an extraordinary amount of talent. I mean, we're in Los Angeles, amazing content, production, writing, uh, people that work super hard, focus on profitability, strong sales, strong management. There is some great technologists. Of course, there's more technologists up north, but I think if you're starting out, I have an amazing technology team that I would put up against any company I've seen. And it's just, you know, just been getting to know the right technologists. Again, goes back to who you partner with. So not only am I bullish, I'm so excited what's been happening in LA and what's going to happen more. And I'm involved. There's great investors out of all parts, out of Boston, out of Chicago. Uh, Tony Pritzker and his group out of Chicago, they had a, they built up Chicago with a really strong entrepreneur community. They're doing it here in Los Angeles. He's done amazing stuff, and uh, I think it's really, really exciting to be an entrepreneur in Los Angeles. I think there's a lot, so LA is pretty spread out, so you know it's a little bit more challenging, but again, I think there's great pockets uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, if you're down in Venice, if you're down in Santa Monica, or even up here in Hollywood, there's, or downtown LA, talking about apparel and commerce, that I think there's, you know, find one of these communities, that's, you know, put a stake in the ground, put an anchor, and more and more growth is going to come and innovation is going to come out of, out of Los Angeles, like it did in aerospace, you know, 50 years ago, like it's done in entertainment, and like it's going to do, I think, in technology. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.